addresses and ports I'm willing to connect to. So a lot of them say, um, I'll, I'll just use the default. Uh, feel free to do web browsing and instant messaging and stuff, but, but please no default uh, file sharing ports. Uh, some of them say, I just want to be a, a relay. I'm just going to relay stuff from Tor to Tor. I don't want to be an exit. I'm going to be a non-exit relay. Um, and then a few of them say, I, I run an ISP. I'm running a Tor server. I am my ISP. I'm just going to open it all up. I'll do anything. Um, so the, the fact that there's this variety means that we can handle people uh, who aren't in a position to deal with abuse complaints, and we can handle people who are. Um, of course, we need some exit relays because uh, otherwise you can't get out of the network. We need somebody to be that, that third hop. But as long as a third of the nodes in the network are willing to be that third hop, um, then it works. Okay, so how do we learn about the other servers in the system? Uh, here are some ways not to do that. One approach, and a lot of the peer-to-peer the -peer systems work this way, is Alice goes up to any server and says, so who are all the Tor servers? And that server, if she chose badly, grins and rubs his hands and says, here are 1,500 of my favorite friends in Venezuela. And Alice, being software, uh, is perfectly happy to use that as the Tor network. She has no idea that she's just been attacked. Uh, so that's, that's one way we don't want to do it. There are some more subtle issues when it comes to anonymity, though. Uh, let's imagine we've got a lot of different servers out there. We've got so many servers that we can't tell every Alice about every server. So one approach would be, we'll just download a subset. Every user will fetch a random 50% of the directory of the, of the, the set of servers out there. And, uh, and then you know they'll only have to use half of it. But the problem here is, if I'm an attacker, and I see that Alice 1 fetches these two-thirds of the nodes, and I see that Alice 2 fetches these two-thirds of the nodes, and I see a connection coming out of this, I know it wasn't Alice 1. So I've now partitioned uh, the set of users, and I can ignore some of them. Um, so this is a, a trivial version of the attack. You might say, well, yeah, but that doesn't seem so bad. Uh, the problem is that if you do this again and again, you can very quickly intersect. You can discard lots of users until you're down to, to just the user that, that, uh, that was the one making the connection. So this is a not very well understood attack at this point, but it's something that worries us in terms of how do we uh, make sure that, that we're giving out uh, network information in a uniform way so that all the users are going to behave the same way. That's where the anonymity comes from. As long as they're making uh, the same sorts of decisions on the same sorts of data, uh, then they're safe. So how do we do it? Uh, the first answer was there are directory servers. There are five places around the internet, and they keep track of all the servers, and their addresses and their public keys uh, ship with Tor, so you know you've got the right one. Um, so the way it works is all the servers would write little server descriptors. They would sign them. They would include address and ports and exit policies and keys and stuff like that. And then they would send them to the trusted directories who would build a huge list and sign it, saying, at this time, these were all the servers in the network. Don't believe anything else. And then those would get cached all throughout the network, and Alice would fetch it from a cache. There were a couple of problems with that. One of them is most of that is duplicate information. Most of the directory that you get now and the directory you get in two hours, they mostly overlap. So it's a shame that you have to download all that stuff again. The other problem is what happens if one of these guys lies? There are five of them. We break into one and we have him list 1,500 computers in Venezuela, and now we're back where we were before. Uh, so what we've changed it to is we have those five and those five directory authorities, and they're going to gather all the list of server descriptors and talk amongst each other and build what's called a network status. And the idea is that network status just lists little snapshots. Here's the hash of the descriptor you should look for. Here's the hash of the key you should expect to find. Here's his IP address and port. Here's whether I think he's running or not. So they would build little 200 kilobyte blobs signed by all five of them, or at least as many of them as are willing to sign it. And then Alice will go fetch that network status, and she just has to fetch that new summary of the, of the network. And at that point, she knows what descriptors are out there, and she can go anywhere, maybe to some of the caches, and fetch those. Uh, so that's the, the, the basic idea. We can talk a little bit more details, but I've got five minutes left, so I'm going to uh, keep on busting through material. Feel free to interrupt me if you've got uh, questions. So we're currently the, 
uh, largest strong anonymity network ever deployed, or the longest distributed the largest distributed trust anonymity uh, ever network ever deployed. We've got uh, I don't know 1,500 servers, uh, quarter million users, hard to say for sure, uh, 150 megabytes a second or more of traffic. Um, a couple of problems. <coughs> Turns out there are bad people on the internet, and Tor can't tell the difference between when nice Alice shows up and tries to make a connection and jerk Alice shows up and tries to make a connection. Um, and it turns out that a lot of services on the internet uh, aren't really very good at authenticating their users or deciding whether they should let people uh, connect. So Slashdot had a problem with uh, folks showing up through Tor and writing Slashdot sucks. Uh, and eventually they decided that the best thing to do was uh, you can read Slashdot through Tor, but please don't post. We've got enough. Uh, enough of that. Uh, and Wikipedia ended up in the same issue, where they had uh, uh, a few people uh, who were very, very persistent showing up through Tor and writing Wikipedia sucks on the George Bush article or whatever they were doing. And, uh, and at that point, they said, OK, you can read Wikipedia, but, but you can't post. Um, and there's certainly another talk in there uh, about how we might deal with that. I've been chatting with the Wikipedia folks about this uh, weird new concept called authentication. Maybe they might have you know, accounts and you might log in. Um, and there, there are a lot more details to getting that right. Uh, but I guess the, the main point uh, that we're trying to work with them for is if there are currently IP addresses that you would block, you should add more roadblocks for them. You should make them solve seven CAPTCHAs, or you should force them to log in and, and prove their value. And if they're not, then hey, no, no roadblocks for the IP addresses that you already like. Um, there's another system out there called Nimble that some folks at Dartmouth are working on. And the idea is um, it gives you a blinded token, which is signed by somebody so that you can know it's a fresh token and so on. But it's, it isn't associated with this IP address. So that means you can show up at Wikipedia and you can say, here's my token, here's my proof that you, haven't black, that you haven't banned or blacklisted this IP address yet, but you don't have to know the IP address. You can ban the token, you'll never hear from me again, but you can't uh, unveil my, my privacy. So that's some approach. Um, another success story, there are IRC networks out there who have problems with trolls showing up and they you know, join 10 or 15 people uh, using Tor show up and then they sidetrack you and, and derail the whole conversation. Uh, Freenode, uh, first started saying, well, we're being attacked. We better ban Tor. Um, but then they said, we don't have to block all the Tor connections. All we have to do is label the Tor users as Tor users. We don't know who they are. They're anonymous. But now when you see a Tor user shows up, another Tor user shows up, a third Tor user shows up, now you can say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm about to get attacked in that way that, that I saw before. So that, that was enough that the trolls have gone back to using their open proxies and their compromised computers and stuff like that because it, it's no longer uh, as effective to attack that way. Um, so that's maybe a success story. Certainly <coughs> some ongoing uh, issues there in terms of how to, have, how to help uh, internet services interact with anonymous users. Another example, uh, Tor is great and all if you can reach the Tor network, but what happens if the Chinese firewall blocks connections to the Tor network? Um, they haven't done this yet. We can certainly talk about uh, sociological questions of, of why not. Uh, but when they do, um, how are we going to handle that arms race in terms of, of letting people be able to get to the Tor network so that they can read Google, so they can you know, read their web comics or whatever it is the firewall's blocking that week? Um, so the, the answer that we're, we've been working on for the past year is a system called Bridges. So the idea is we've got a few hundred thousand users out there. Can we give them a little button in Vidalia that says, help censored users? And if they click that button, now they turn into a relay, not in the main Tor network, not in the directory, not in anything you can look up, but in some separate database of, of volunteers just for being bridges. So the idea is the blocked user connects to, through the user into the main Tor network. So Alice doesn't have to be an exit node. She's just relaying traffic. And she doesn't have to relay very much, maybe 20 kilobytes a second is great for somebody in Iran who otherwise would be on a modem and doesn't have any ha, and is censored by his country. Um, so we've changed the arms race from how do we keep 1500 public IP addresses out of the hands of the Chinese government, which is an impossible problem, to how do we take 100,000 IP addresses and give them out one at a time to the good guys without letting the bad guys learn all of them. And that's an arms race that I hope I can handle. 
I'd be happy to chat with